just a minute. Hey folks, it's, it's Dion Baker and Jay D'Souza. And today we have taken over RJ's YouTube channel, which is really awesome. <laughs> RJ won't be joining us today. So now you're just getting J and D. And today we're gonna talk about um, how to find shirt designs legally that you can use on your products in your Etsy shop. So we are gonna share this in a couple other places. Um, if you're joining us live, go ahead and say hi, leave us a comment, you know, let us know you can see us and you can hear us. Um, and feel free to ask questions inside of the little comments and we'll try our best to answer them as we get through some of this content here. So we're gonna give it a few minutes for people to just ju jump on live with us um, and see who we get, see who comes to party. But I think it's really fun that uh, we're taking over RJ's YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, okay, fine, uh, we got Linda watching on the Facebook. I'm going to try to stay on top of that. I will share this in the Etsy group and in the Slack. Hi, Dominic, and hi, Wrapped Up Designs. How are you doing? So I can see the little comments that come from YouTube and stuff, um, too, which is cool. Nice. So we're going to share this. Hi, Mario. <laughs> He gave us permission, he did. I didn't like hack him or anything. <laughs> so it's gonna be exciting. I'm gonna share my screen a little bit, um, or I think maybe Jay might end up sharing his screen since this topic is something Jay knows a whole lot about. Um, I usually end up designing most of my own stuff. So does Jay a lot of the time, because like we're, we both have graphic design backgrounds. But for the most part, um, you can find some really cool resources out there and places that will allow you to use shirt designs that they've designed um, legally. And you know, usually it comes with payment or whatever, but if you wanted something that was your own, if you wanted to like commission somebody, we're gonna talk about how you would find people to outsource um, that kind of work to so that you're creating your own original designs as well. So it's a great little strategy overall in terms of trying to figure out how to outsource so that you have some more time. If you're not the best graphic designer, if you don't really know what's gonna look good on a shirt um, and how to find, you know, how to basically just stock your store with products that are really cool. So, so yeah, so I was just gonna say one of the, uh, the major things with Etsy is as a shop owner, you have to have at least a part in the handmade process, right? So you have to either be coming up with your own designs to a degree, um, you know, creating your own sort of thing. But um, there are ways you can get extra help by way of, you know, getting designers and stuff, that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, there's all kinds of ways to work on that. Um, how are we doing for people on here, D? I think we got enough to kind of jump right in. I just want right. to um, really address a couple of comments right, right off the hop. So Roughed Up Design says, the other day when I was talking a lot of, about a lot of effort um, for Etsy compared to Redbubble, I do work about nine to 12 hours a day on the Redbubble. And then they said, as an effort, it wasn't being negative. It's just trying to juggle my own printing company. Totally. And so sometimes that's the thing. It's like um, what we say a lot of the time as, as coaches here at Ready and Scale is that it's important for you guys to actually put your focus and attention on the things that are obviously bringing you money right now, right? And then separately, when you have more time, it's obviously more important for you to focus on the things that either you're good at, you have some skill set in, or that you have interest in doing. So we this topic comes up a lot as it relates to kind of, you know, some people think, oh, well, I have to have a Facebook page and a Pinterest page, and then I have to be on Twitter, and I have to be on Instagram, and I have to be all these different places in order to showcase my brands or to like help myself get more sales and stuff like that. And what we always say is that like, if you don't tweet, if you don't understand the ecosystems that you're going into on those platforms, um, if it's not something that's in your wheelhouse and it's not something that you like, you don't like the people over there, or whatever, it's not a good idea to be on Twitter. You know what I mean? If, if you don't pin, if you don't play on Pinterest, if you have no boards, you don't understand it, it's not a good idea for you to be on Pinterest. You know what I mean? So if your brand requires that because ultimately like your fan base or your target audience is over there, absolutely. It's a, a, a strategy you want to work into the branding and the marketing and all the placement that you're doing. But when it comes down to it, you want to outsource that to somebody who actually likes to do it because that's going to be the best way 
for you to get the love over there, right? Somebody who understands it, who likes it, who enjoys doing it. And that way for you, you don't end up feeling stuck or like inhibited by your business, right? Doing things that you hate for all sure. the time, just trying to make some money. So yeah, I mean, if you if you're in a, you know, you paint yourself into a corner, so to speak with a task, and it's not that you can't do it, it's that you just either despise it or find it completely boring and you're unmotivated, it's going to translate in your posts. It's going to translate in the lack of the posts potentially even. Right. So yeah, exactly. Same, same goes with the Facebook pages and stuff. You know, like I'm, I got one that I just keep going, but I'm terrible with it. Right. And that's the kind of thing that you should be outsourcing for sure. If you're not going to be consistently because consistency is the key. Right. Yeah. And that's what RJ is always saying too. I was just about to say that I was going to say, if RJ was here, he'd be like, you guys, if, if you can't be consistent, <laughs> you kill it. Right? Like that's what he would say. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. so let's just hop in and, and start talking about, um, I guess, designing for Etsy or where you can find some designs for Etsy that you could maybe purchase that aren't going to break your bank account and that are legal for you to use and print um, through a print provider. How about you? You lead us into that one, Jay. Sure. So there's a few places. So you just have to ultimately check the commercial licensing. So, Let's, I guess, preface with um, the fact that with Etsy as a shop owner, you have to be either, it says explicitly, the owner must be uh, the seller and also be making and or designing items sold as handmade. So make sure that you have an element of your own design aspect on there. And that kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of the creative license and commercial licensing artwork that you will download anyway. You're typically not allowed to use it as is. They want you to make some kind of variation, which also makes sense because if you're gonna be buying or um, you know, getting commercial licenses for downloadable artwork from somewhere else, or buying packages and that sort of thing, you don't want to be putting up the same shirt that potentially everybody else is going to be putting up to. We see that on, on various platforms, right? You'll Google something or search something in their, in their uh, shop search bar and you'll have like multiple results for the same, same exact look of thing. And you even see it in Etsy now is, it, I mean, it's terrible. Um, so that said, um, any help you get in your shop. So there's a couple of ways to do this. You can uh, get a designer and by doing that, you can, I mean, you can source designers and stuff on like the uh, DeviantArt or um, any any kind of designers, uh, Facebook pages, fan pages, that sort of thing that you, uh, um, that you admire if you're not great at creating something or they create something outside of your wheelhouse. So that's Even like- Sometimes uh, you can find some good ones on Behance, like new people that yeah. are just sitting on Behance because they share their creative work yeah. over there. Yeah, and that's the idea, right? So what you would want to do is work out something with them in terms of, it's it's almost like a intro to licensing 101 kind of thing. You can, you know, shoot them a message, tell them that, you know, what you think of their artwork and if ask them if they'd be interested in kind of joining your shop as a shop member. And as long as you list them as a shop member and, you know, you can put them as a designer or curator and or both, but Etsy's house rules are just be transparent. So be honest, tell them, this person's a designer and then you can, you know, have them have access to your shop, upload stuff or send you the designs. You can upload it and that's all above board and allowed. Um, the other way you can get some designs. Um, there, there are a bunch of websites out there. Uh, another good one for downloading is T-Shirt Factory. Um, they are in Latvia, I think, Riga, Latvia. And uh, they have a lot of stuff on sale that goes on sale all the time, packages. And you can also buy packages of artwork from specific designers. So if you like, you know, an artwork style or suits your kind of your niche for your store, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of the times the artwork pieces there are 15 to $25 per shirt, but they have a lot of like 50% off, 60% off sales that go on. So you can get some really good packages there uh, or, or one-offs even. Uh, but again, I, I have to stress that you need to alter these in some way in order to be able to use them legally on Etsy. You have to ultimately finish, like, be responsible for that final piece. And as the owner of your shop, you are responsible for absolutely everything that goes on in your shop. So um, make sure you read all the house rules and get through that. But uh, there's also Shutterstock. You can get commercial licenses for things. Um, it's, I believe, $99 per unique piece of art on top of your membership subscription. So people think that just because you pay 
uh, you know, $150 a month for 50 downloads or whatever it is a month that you can just put these up and make money. No, they're not for commercial use. You can use them to solicit yourself commercially in a way to advertise yourself. So you can use them, to create flyers showing your artistic ability. Say I'm a designer. Here are some things that I can do that sort of thing or graphic elements. Uh, but you cannot just download and re upload for sale, anything like that. So even on a shirt design, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, I believe it was $99 us the last time I checked. It's been a while now, um, for her that one, but it gives you 12 months of commercial, uh, rights to that design. Um, like you said, Behance is a great one too. If you want to get, you know, somewhere where you can partner up with designers too. DeviantArt is great. Is always been like, that was kind of the old school one for me. Um, Facebook fan page, find an art, find a piece of art that you like. Um, look up the artist, search them on Facebook. You can fall into certain niches of fan pages and that sort of thing, or their own portfolio pages, that sort of thing. Um, reach out to them. Worst case, they'll be flattered by a compliment and you know, it's an easy way into a conversation. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's easy to work out things like that. So you can either end up buying exclusive designs from them for you that you're going to tweak and then upload, or you can, um, work out a royalty system, however you want to do it. If let's say you don't have the money to buy a whole bunch up front, you could, you know, offer them two, three bucks a pop of every shirt you sell or that sort of thing, or you can split the profits 50, 50, however you want to go about it. But, uh, yeah, talking away here, but lots of options to get, um, artwork to supplement your catalog and you know help build and grow faster when if if and when um creating design work yourself is either you know overwhelming or it's just too much or you're just not great at it right? well and i think the thing is too it's like i think a lot of people fall into this trap of if you've never done it before like you've never actually outsourced something like that before um you're kind of afraid you're like oh is it going to cost a lot of money is this person going to say that like after they design it, maybe they like it or they see what I'm doing. And then like all of a sudden they're going to copy me or something. Or like, you know, you have these, these fears that are largely in a lot of ways unfounded, right? Like designers don't generally take on jobs that they, then they're going to go open up a competitive shop with you. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they're specific in their lane. They're doing their own designs. They might already have some of their own shops or whatever. And, you know, um, like some of them are even designing for places like creative market or those asset places where you can kind of buy artwork to put on things. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be the type of people that are like, oh, hey, I see what you're doing. And I'm just going to like snatch your stuff and, and, you know, tweak it a little bit and then like put it on my own products. Separately from that, it's not always crazy expensive. Like I know there are some illustrators that like you can find in, in the Facebook groups, like. Um, if you go into Facebook groups for graphic design or for illustration, or like even some of the Adobe groups, like the tool groups, affinity groups, things like that, you'll find that there are illustrators in there. And a lot of the times for as, as little as like $75, depending on, you know, where they are and, and who they are, you can get exclusive rights to a design, right? So um, it's not a crazy investment. Like now, naturally, if you were to do that 10 times in the span of like the same day, yeah, that's 750 bucks, right? But if you start out with like a couple designs, you want to try a couple new designers or a couple new illustrators, it's actually not a crazy expense to, to just try it out and see how it goes if you like their style or whatever, and it matches with the branding and the identity of your shop, right? So when it comes to actually like outsourcing these designs, you know, there's a variety of different um, approaches to take to it, which is what Jay was getting at. Like in terms of if there's a royalty split, like say you don't have a lot of money to, to kind of get this thing started, um, you can potentially ask them if they want to collaborate, right? Where you're going to sell it, they're going to design it, and then you're going to split the profits. However, you're going to split, split the profits, right? Um, and a lot of times people will be open to that if you can show them your links and show them that you actually have some sales and some following um, because naturally they're going to do a job essentially one time and they're going to make money as long as that design continues to sell. Even sometimes in like merch relationships. So like I know some of you guys are on merch. I'm not on merch, but I know that there are people who have these giant merch accounts, right? Like they've been on merch a long time. They have a bunch of open slots to fill or whatever, and they might not necessarily be the best graphic designer. <laughs> you know what I mean? They might've started out when it was like 
super young and now they've got this big like catalog and they've got some winners in that catalog but even sometimes when you go look at their catalogs you're like damn this this design is ugly <laughs> right but it's selling so like more power yeah. to them right and so when you're thinking about things um in that light like those people need designs right like so they're gonna outsource those designs they're gonna work with people and and work into some license agreement of like i'm gonna sell this design for my merch and maybe through my etsy and maybe on my own shopify website or something like that and every time it sells i'm gonna give you x amount of dollars like two dollars or a dollar or whatever right so there's a variety of different ways that you can actually um work with illustrators and the thing is like you always want to be respectful of their time and of their work right so one of those key things is if you are working with an illustrator like jay said this already and you're going to put that on etsy you have to disclose that on your etsy shop they have to be listed there as a designer for whatever product that they're working on okay that being said though like you want to make sure that if you're going to work with somebody you're going to give them a design brief like you don't want to waste their time in a sense where you know you've agreed to a rate of like 75 dollars or 100 dollars for this this art piece and you just give them a quote and you say, oh, just go with it, right? Because at the end of the day, if the person doesn't know your shop, they don't know your audience, they don't know like what those people like, what color choices, what font styles, anything like that, you're kind of just, you're not giving them a, a tight enough sandbox to work within. And then what they could do is spend a lot of time designing maybe a beautiful article or a beautiful design that just doesn't actually match your shop. So when you're going to work with people like this it's always a good idea to come up with like a design brief in a sense right and so i know that those words are like terms right like business terms in a sense that maybe people don't really know what it means but it's like you're gonna basically just layer in some parameters for what you're looking to receive from whatever artist that you're working with right so it's like you know i like these specific fonts this is the kind of design style that my shop likes to sell. This is what the brand is about. You know what I mean? This is what, you know, I'm seeing in maybe like even competitively, I don't want you to copy these. I don't want my things to look like these. You know what I mean? I want them to look like this and maybe have this different element. You want to basically just write out what it is, the end result that you're looking for. Um, and then let them, the creative person be creative and come up with a, a kick-ass design. Right? So, yeah. I mean, I would even go one step further there and maybe even backtrack. So in the beginning, you want to, you know, have your kind of niche market figured out, right? You want to know who your target audience is. Then I would look at not just designers whose artwork you like or enjoy, make sure it fits that niche, right? So you don't want to be, you know, buying a piece of artwork from an artist to make your own after and or an exclusive piece and then um, buying from somebody else because it won't match, right? You want like a cohesive design element. So you want to work with a designer who already kind of is in that same sort of style or vibe or is almost there enough that you can, with a little bit of a design brief, like Dee's saying, uh, you can kind of guide them, you know, uh, to do something in that same kind of vein for what your vision is for that shop, right? You don't want to be finding like a, um, a line drawing artist to do something like, uh, on the anime side or something like that, right? It's just a, a completely different, you know, somebody does great charcoal sketches. They're not going to be great on the, you know, cartoony side necessarily, right, sort of thing. So uh, just because art is something you you like or see that they are capable of, just try to find somebody or source somebody who kind of fits your MO. Yeah, and I think that that's super important too because even if you, if you go on Behance and you're looking at some of these top designers that work with like huge brands or whatever, they have their very specific styles that they really like to work inside of, right? And so that's kind of in their wheelhouse. And a lot of those designer, designers, by the time they get to that level, like where they're actually working with big brands, they won't take on, they're apt at recognizing, okay, this isn't quite my style and they won't take on those kinds of jobs. But the designers that are up and coming that are just starting, you know, they want to eat too. So they they generally, even if they're not that great at something, might take something on in hopes that it will be good enough. And that's just not in the wheelhouse. It's not, you know, their strength design wise. And then you're not having a great relationship or a great experience when you're paying them to do a design for your specific shop, right? So yeah. it really does make a lot of sense for you to sit down before you even get into like, where do I find the designs or where do I find a designer <clears throat> and really think through, okay, like, 
the tenants of your brand. And I, I say this always comes back to that, right? Like it always comes back to who is your ideal customer? Who is your target audience? How well do you understand them? What do they want? What's missing in the marketplace, right? And so when you understand those things, it's really easy for you to sit at your desk and say, okay, I know like this specific customer really well. So I, I know they're gonna like, you know, black shirts, white type. I know they're gonna like mostly text based on their shirt. I know it's gonna be something that's gonna be like maybe a little distressed or vintage vibe, but not so distressed or vintage vibe that it comes off as hippie. You know what I mean? I know there's gonna be like, maybe sometimes that swashes are completely okay if the design in the middle is badass. Like if that's your audience, right? You have to be able to qualify that to whatever designer that you're gonna be working with in order to get the best end result and not to end up churning or spinning out too much, going back and forth with like iterations or revisions on your design, right? Yeah, and I think a good way to keep the designer interested too on the flip side of that is because so like if you're, you know, you're paying full pop, ideally the goal is to own the, yeah, we've got Banksy's number, great. Right? But uh, ideally the goal is to own the artwork outright so you don't have to pay a royalty forever because right now, like when, when you get your feet wet though, um, it's an easy, inexpensive way to work out a deal with an artist, right? Because especially if they're kind of up and coming, so you can shoot them a buck or two or split the profits or whatever. But over time, if you sell, if you're shooting them, you know, $5 a pop or $3 a pop, but you sell 100 shares, now you've paid $300 as opposed to buying it outright for 75 bucks, right? So, but that said, you don't want to go out and buy 10 pieces to what D's number was saying earlier at 750 bucks. If you don't know they're going to sell, if you're new to the game, that sort of thing, it's a large investment that could just fall flat and you'd be in the red forever trying to make up for that, right? So uh, in the beginning, I think working out some kind of royalty commission based kind of thing is a great way to keep the new artist interested to invested in the project because they're going to want to pump out some really cool stuff that they think is better than your competition after you show them all the research and stuff so that they can make more money thinking that, well, if I make two bucks a pop, well, I'm going to do something that I think I can sell a hundred of these, right? At least. Um, Absolutely. Well, and I think that there's something to be said too about um, building the trust in the relationship with, with mm -hmm. whatever the team is that you're working with, right? Because there's a lot of situations in which like you would approach an artist like that and maybe they've already been screwed over by somebody before, right? Like maybe they did that kind of royalty split and then they found out that that person was also selling yourself on eBay and also selling themselves over here at this other shop that they didn't tell them about and stuff like that. So they've been burned and now they're a little leery about like doing that same thing again. Right. So you want to build trust by being in those groups, by talking to people, by like having, you know, built up some sort of like they feel like they know you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, that, seen it so many times, right, like on a fiver or something, somebody will go and do a custom design for you and you pay your whole five dollars and get it done. And then it turns out you do a Google search for your image or whatever. And it turns out they're, uh, you know, they've sold it to six or seven other people already and maybe that number grows to 60 or 70 other people and now it's no longer your exclusive design, right? Or they've ripped it off from somebody in the beginning. Like I used to see that right. a lot so, because I used to do, and I still do, um, Shopify setups for people. It would be amazing to me how many times people would go on Fiverr or something like that and they'd be like, oh, I got this exclusive logo and it would only cost me five bucks. And then I would reverse search that and it would have come off somebody else's account at Behance and they've just really changed the name or like changed something about it to try and make it look like it's their work. And it's like you as the person who's doing the commissioning, you need to be like looking at that stuff from time, like from the very beginning. Like when you get these submissions, you need to be doing that reverse image search to make sure that like actually you're gonna end up being able to have the rights to that design in the end because it is an exclusive and new design, right? Because a lot of those other things, like they're copyrighted, they're trademarked. And if people see all, all of a sudden you have that, like some slight variation of their logo on your website, they're gonna come and they're gonna tell you to take it down, right? Oh, yeah. Because they paid good money and they have a brand to protect, right? So you wanna be doing some research absolutely as part of this process. Um, there's one little comment here that I wanna highlight by Tim. He said, I spent $300 for my tax return on exclusive design assets, uh, then used those to scale a few dozen designs. In three weeks, I've already made 217 of it. And that's the thing, like that's that's exactly the strategy that we're talking about here. So if you know you're not great at design, you know, you know, you could basically spend some money, invest in your shop a little bit, get the kind of design that you know your audience is gonna like, you can very quickly, like probably by the end of the month, you know, his initial investment is covered. And then like everything else after that is gravy, right? Like it's just all profit. So 
these are the ways that you kind of work on scaling your business, right? Because you can't do everything all the time, okay? Like there's only so many hours in the day. And as your businesses get busier and your sales grow and your shops grow and recognition of your stuff grows, naturally, like you're spending more time on customer service. You're spending more time on all of these little areas of your shop that require more and more time, but the hours in the day stay the same. So at some point, you definitely do have to look at how you can minimize your own um, impact by like outsourcing certain elements of whatever you're doing, even if it's listing or something like that, research, whatever, whatever you're doing um, in order to kind of help yourself keep moving forward. And I mean, from that point, it's just like the sky's the limit. You can scale it as far as it will scale. For sure. I mean, and then, you know, with that money that you're making, once you're flat, you can reinvest that $300 now that you've made back into a next set of designs or something where or design elements that you can use to create your own again. Right. So uh, smart. Good job, Tim. So, so here's another one here that said it's Taman, I think it is. Uh, what company did you suggest we use other than Printful for printing? I know there was one we suggested a while back. So we suggested using Shirtly um, if you're doing shirts. And the reason for that is that Shirtly really has um, been crushing it for a, a lot of us. Like, so Printful, a lot of the other big shops um, really were having hard times with keeping that order turnaround um, at a consistent level during the pandemic. And, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so like, I get it, but Shirtly has been really crushing it. Like just, I mean, up until recently, they were doing one to three business day turnarounds and it was like legit one to three business days. And then um, I think because they got busy, they had to up it to like three to five, but still like five business day turnaround is like, you know, amazing. Is five, <laughs> you know? Times, better, is five times better than 25 day turnaround from painful. Absolutely, right? And so, so that's the thing. So like we were saying, you know, shortly is definitely the way to go. Um, naturally, I think we did share a link and it was an affiliate link. So like we, we try to be as transparent as possible about all of that. You know what I mean? Because we love Shirtly. All, all of our personal shops um, are, go through Shirtly. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things that like we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is because they do such a good job for us. We use them ourselves. Um, we, we're trying to tell people about it and get more people over there, helping them grow so that they can eventually have more products and have, you know, leggings and coffee mugs and whatever else that oh, you guys want to see. But right now it is mostly shirts on Shirtly. Um, okay, so, now so I did put the link in our private chat on this stream and in the Facebook um, message to like our, your private message, but I can't post anything. Oh, on. okay. So I'll put the link right there. I'll drop it in then. I don't have I mean, to. I'm still learning the backside of this because yeah. normally RJ drives the bus for us. So I just dropped the link now into and the- And I don't have permission. Second. <laughs> well, you knew permission after, but it was after we already started. And I was like, no, I got this. I want to drive bus. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, okay. So there's another one here. There was a question I just saw. Right above that, one, what about Pixabay? I am snotty. So- I Oh, there you go. Feel bad for you. I hope it's seasonal. <laughs> hope it's not a permanent thing um but yeah no so pixabay i really don't know anything about them i know a lot of people have mentioned them in my travels through facebook pages and design rabbit holes uh i tend to think about pixabay as more of a clip art kind of factory i don't really know much about them but i would say read the tos read your uh which is the terms of service read all about the commercial licensing um i've heard if I recall correctly, that there was um, somebody stolen artwork from a designer on Pixabay. So be very careful. I mean, that can happen anywhere. I've seen it on Shutterstock and other big reputable places, but uh, be careful, do your research and read the terms of service and make sure they have a commercial license available. I get it in writing. Okay, so then there's another question here from Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Um, so is it common for the design file or sorry, common to ask for the design file from the artist or no? I would say yes. So anytime somebody asks me to do a commission, what I send them is an Adobe Illustrator file. I send them an EPS. I send them an SVG. I send them a ping. I send them a JPEG. And then I send them a PDF. <laughs> so like there's all those different formats that they have available to them. So like if they don't have exactly the, the graphic design software on their computer for whatever reason, um, they're going to you know use some other thing other than Adobe products, whatever, to layer those those designs that I've sent them onto a shirt or something like that, or they're having it printed. 
Um, I just want to make it as easy as possible for them to do whatever they need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, with that design file at the end. And that's a pretty consistent practice for most graphic designers, right? Like most reputable ones anyway. Like the, I find in the marketplace, there are a bunch of noobs that don't do that. Like they, they will send you like a JPEG or a ping. And then what problem that creates, especially if it's something like you're getting a, a logo design for your shop that you're gonna print on your shirts or something like that, is that like the, the software can't read those files, right? Like you can put a ping on top of something, but what happens if you need to really blow that up and the quality just isn't there? Or what happens yeah. if you need a specific type of file, like a, an AI or, or like a digital graphic file, and you know, cause you wanna make a change to your logo two years from now, well, now you have to go back to that original designer who may or may not be still designing to try and pay them more money to make that change for you because you don't have the actual rights to the file or and you don't have the file right and so like i've seen a lot of companies like a lot of small businesses get into trouble with this where like they don't know what to ask for in the beginning and then they just assume that like whoever they're working with is giving them exactly what they need and then it comes down to okay well you know three years five years out they want to make one small change to their logo or something or and then it up on a vehicle wrap or something, right? And then or, taking, or like sometimes the website. Yeah, or sometimes like even the other thing I see, which like it just it, it drives me nuts as somebody who actually knows how to use the graphic design programs and whatever. But like something else I'll see is that it's completely obvious when they do send like an AI file or something like that. And then like so say let, let's say a for instance, you're the client, you're not a graphic designer, you don't have the, the tools on your computer you know you want a logo, you've hired somebody to make you this logo. They send you that like digital file so that they say that it's editable and like it can be resized and all this stuff. And then when you go to like put that on a vehicle wrap or you go to put that somewhere that requires that digital file and you send that file to like an actual graphic designer who works for that company, they come back telling you that like the file's wrong, right? And why the file is wrong is because they maybe layered some crap on the background or they've traced parts of this logo that they've done from you from artwork that they snatched from somewhere else. So the lines aren't all clean. Like I've seen almost everything happen sure. with this, yeah. right? Where like, I've seen it even be where like, for, for whatever reason, whoever made the logo just literally didn't know what they were doing. So like, I would have to go back through and like delete certain parts of the background in order to be able to put that logo, like as a transparent logo on, on top of a product. And it's like, you end up costing yourself so much time and, and money because like essentially when you hire that new graphic designer to fix that problem, you're generally gonna be paying almost the same as what it, it cost you on your initial investment for that that item. So- yeah, and, and more, right? Because now just because, so when you go to that professional designer, like myself, for example, in D's situation, I've corrected so many peop of other people's mistakes uh, and, and re had to recreate files that not only is the my product cost or my service cost isn't going to change from if anything it's gone up now because i'm making more money it's not going down i'll tell you that right what i charge for logo design and branding but now because my client's budget has been reduced by the hundred dollars that they wasted over here that doesn't you know quantify me reducing my service charge to help you out like i'm helping you out by recreating this mess it's a lot easier to create something from scratch that it is to go and fix other people's mistakes, especially when you don't know exactly how the composition was, right? So yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And that's the thing. It's the yeah. thing. You gotta you gotta know these things before you even get started, right? So um, there's another one here that said, is Shirtley in the USA or do they have a European base? I'm in the UK. They're actually a uh, they ship it of Canada, so it's North American. They do do shipping though overseas, right, Jay? Oh yeah, they ship everywhere. Um, they they will ship from Toronto to literally anywhere. I think there's three countries or four countries they've recently put up in the last two months that they have ceased to ship to. I think that was like largely pandemic related. There was like some major, major slowdowns or border shuts or customs shutting or something like that. Uh, so they will DHL or courier their stuff to, I believe it's Illinois somewhere. And then from there it flips to USPS and hits everywhere stateside. So. Uh, even that said, five to five to eight days of what my orders are taking one ship. So, you know, your customer can plausibly get it in their hand in eight to 10 business days from the time of order or from the time you actually place the order. 
Um, and the other thing too, we forgot to mention is that uh, Ready Aim Scale affiliate link is exclusive to us and to you guys who want to use it. You get a dollar off, one US dollar off your first hundred orders. So um, Taman, if you didn't use the one we had in the Etsy challenge at 15% off for 30 days, this one actually could be better for you because there's no expiry on it other than your uh, when you hit your numbers. Yeah, so, that's pretty cool. So what else um, can we talk about today as it relates to this? I think we had something, we we were sitting here and we were thinking about, okay, like what are all the content? What are we, we going to tell these people about Etsy today? And so I know last week we did some printable research and it seemed like you guys really liked seeing like the, the designs on screen kind of thing. Um, so, okay, so here's a few. We got some comments now coming in. <laughs> so I'm finding it hard to find design ideas for Etsy rather than chasing a trend. So that's a great topic. We can go down that road for the next like- Stop chasing trends. <laughs> right? Um, so, I don't know. I think um, design ideas. So start with what you like and what you enjoy and what you do as a hobby or things that you spend money on, right? So what kind of things do you do for fun? That is essentially, if, if you do something for fun, there's going to be a hundred to a million other people that kind of partake in a similar kind of idea or whatever it is, right? Whether it's, I don't know, fishing or um, people watching even or staying home, being an introvert and just, you know, Netflixing and chilling kind of thing. Um, those are the kind of things. So if you're into uh, fishing, for example, like I am, uh, and, you know, instead of saying good luck to people, you say tight lines, because if your line is tight, typically that means you got a fish on the end of it, right? So tight lines is kind of like a, a, a quip or, a, you know, a saying that we say uh, to each other and only people in the know would know that. So people get it when they see a shirt, they know that it was designed for us by us sort of thing. Right. Um, so that's the kind of thing. So I would say like, if you need design ideas, start with slogans, words, text-based work, man. Like, uh, people want to read stuff more than they want to look at things. So, um, yeah, find out, take, take time to self-assess and see what what it is you like you enjoy uh and start there because you will know more about that particular topic than the general public right so yeah and so i agree with that too i think i think you always want to start with niches that like are of interest to you that you're part of because traditionally when you start that way you're already kind of in some groups um on facebook that kind of are around that niche you already have friends in that niche you know, that, that are enjoying the same things that you are just because you're, you're involved in it. Right. So like if it's fishing, like Jay's example, he has buddies he goes fishing with, you know what I mean? He can bounce ideas off of those people um, pretty easily. Like when he's creating his fishing stuff, like if it's camping, I'm sure you have friends that you go camping with or people that you've met. If it's hiking on trails, you know, same idea. You meet people when you're out there hiking and doing that sort of stuff. You see people's names over and over in the certain log books that they have at the hiking camps and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it's like you're part of that niche and that kind of extends even further. So like if we're talking about um, one of the bigger niches that I see a lot of people try to go after, which is like the mommy and me niche, right? Like our, our young moms kind of, right? So like we'll say like 26-ish to maybe like 35, okay? So I see a lot of people just come into this niche and they're straight clowning everybody else. They're, li they're literally just looking at other people's stuff that's out there, creating their exact same version, maybe using a different font, slapping that on a shirt and hoping it's going to sell. And then when it doesn't, like they're confused about like why it didn't sell. Right. And it's like, well, if you're not part of that niche and like you're not engaging in that niche, like in groups or like even through other things, like just through um, Instagram accounts that you follow or like, you know, pages on Pinterest or like whatever, right? You're not engaging at all. Like that strategy of just seeing what's in the marketplace and copying it and making it a little bit cheaper traditionally doesn't work. It's not successful because you don't understand who you're making products for, right? And you don't understand why those people buy from the specific brands that are already making sales in those categories, right? And so if you don't understand those two very crucial things, then of course, you know, you don't really have a starting place when it comes to trying to figure out what kind of designs these people would like. Um, and I always, I always say, 
the better strategy in life, instead of going in and kind of repeating what you already see is selling in the marketplace is going in and finding a gap or changing something, innovating something, doing better than something that's already in the marketplace, right? So these gaps are really traditionally easy to spot. Like if you know how to do some keyword research, um, like you, you use a tool like Etsy rank, you can even just use Google or like the search bar in Etsy, if we're talking Etsy specific stuff, right? And you can start to see, okay, like, so in the mom and me niche, there's not maybe a lot of stuff for tattooed moms, or there's not really a lot of stuff for sweary moms, or there's not really a lot of stuff for helicopter moms. Do you know what I mean? There's all these little subcategories of parenting styles, of places that people live, of the way that people, you know, lifestyles essentially that they impart to their children that you're not actually seeing. Um, sometimes there's not even a good amount of stuff. Like when I go and I look, there's some like on Etsy specifically, I find like cause stuff like so if for people whose children have Asperger's or who have um, autism, right? There aren't awesome designs for those like, no, they're all right. Yeah. And like, I, I remember I said something similar to this a while back about a different kind of um, subject. And I got crucified. People were so mad that I, I said the designs weren't good, but they just weren't like, <laughs> they just you know what I mean? They, like they look like very elementary, basic entry level designs. It didn't look like anything that had been professionally done by a graphic designer or somebody who had some experience in branding or creating these kinds of elements, right? And so even that, like if you come into one of those niches with cooler designs, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? With like just better, better designs in general, that in and of itself is going to set you apart from what's currently competing in that category, right? And that's what you're really trying to do. That's what generally will lead to more success is when you find something in the marketplace that you can do better or that you can like kind of switch up a little bit and be interesting, right? Because people are sick and tired of seeing the same old, same old. So when they see something new, they're like, oh damn, that looks good, that's different, right? And that's the thing, like people, when they shop, they're not shopping for products. I say this all the time. People buy based on emotion. People want to express themselves, right? So like a t-shirt isn't really a t-shirt, it's a means of self-expression, right? So sure, yes, physically it is a t-shirt, but what's on that t-shirt is gonna determine whether somebody like me buys it versus somebody like, you know, a mom who has four kids at home and homeschools all her kids and maybe is a stay-at-home mom. Like clearly we're gonna, depending on what's on the same shirt, we're, we're not gonna be necessarily interested in that exact same design, right? And so it's like, you have to understand that people buy that emotional connectivity to things. And so how those things look, how they make them feel, those are the things that will really drive your brand forward and determine how well your items sell. And if you're not good at knowing that right now, like if you're not good at knowing, okay, this design is going to make somebody feel excited or this design is going to make somebody laugh or like whatever, it's going to resonate on some emotional pillar. What you need to start doing is spending some time getting to know your target audience, right? Because all of those things come out in the research. Like if you just even spend some time in a specific Facebook groups, like, so uh, for instance, and I'm going to try not to make this like a 20 minute, for instance, I'm good at that. I like to talk, but um, uh, for instance, I'm super into true crime, right? And right now there's like this big true crime case that's happening. It's like really unfolding in front of like everybody. And it's unique in that, like in the Facebook groups for that specific tr true crime case, like the family members that are involved in the case are in there. Um, some of the like friends of those family members are in there. And then like, you've got a bunch of just random people who just like me are just interested in this case. They just want to know what's going to happen. Right. And there's so many twists and turns and there's so many things, but if somebody were to make some shirts based on some of the memes, some of the funny things that are happening in that group, some of the, the repeated sayings and put that in a shop as it related like to true crime, I'm sure it would probably sell. Right. And it's because that person would understand like the hallmarks of these cases that get people so riled up and invigorated and like active in these groups, right? Yeah, and it, it creates that little that semblance of like exclusivity too, because you're kind of in the know with this, you know, a separate. Absolutely, kind of it does. 
And then they become, they end up like wearing it loud and proud and showing and, and become your brand ambassadors. And that's the best kind of influencing you could ever have. Right. Absolutely. Uh, And that's the thing. And you learn about those people by participating in those groups. And so sometimes like, even when you come in and you're new, so like, even I found it with true crime, like I followed true crime since like forever. Right. But I'll find I'll come into some groups and like, I'll make a comment and it's like, not even a bad comment. Like I'm not mean to anybody ever. Right. But, um, I'll make a comment and people like come in on you. You know what I mean? They're like, no, da, 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 da. Like they want to get into an argument with you and you'll very quickly know based on the temperature of the group, what kinds of comments are going to get them riled up like that? What kinds of comments like they're going to be okay with and what the kind of group think is in that specific group. Like it's very quick and easy to see just by participating even for like as little as a couple hours, you know what I mean? So as part of your research, like if there are groups that are, you know, active and they have engaged people, join those groups, see what they're talking about, see what they're joking about, see what kinds of memes they're using to make fun of people. Like there's groups for everything. There's groups for TV shows, groups for niches, groups for parenting, groups for literally everything. And that is going to be a great way for you to brainstorm some ideas, right? Because there's going to be repeating themes that come across cross in those groups over and over again there's going to be things that they hate that they like will talk for years about in that group or complain about there's going to be things that they love and there's going to be an overarching consensus like if it's a tv show group for instance of the characters they love versus the characters that are the villains you know what i mean there's going to be all of that kind of stuff and from that you can really like just get your creative brain flowing in order to make some really cool designs that aren't out there in the marketplace yet that will serve those audiences, right? Okay, so are there other yeah. questions? Yeah, so I was just looking here and uh, so someone just say maybe uh, best to use shortly for USA Canada orders and look into a UK printer maybe. So two things there, they're still shipping I believe to the UK in about 10 business days, which is not bad at all from you know across the, across the pond. However, um, Shipping from outside the UK, which is nothing new. Our UK shoppers understand this. You guys know that you will have to pay VAT on your end. Uh, but if it's shipped within the UK, my understanding is you alleviate the VAT. So um, depends on you know how fast you can find somebody to ship that way uh, within the UK. Uh, so basically, <laughs> sorry, I had to, I had to highlight this. <laughs> this is the thing right because his previous comment was like trends are so tempting but if you you can do trends within your niche but think long game right so like is it worth the time yeah you can make you know five thousand dollars in two months or a month if your design pops off but then after that what do you what do you have left right like what's the trend i Yeah. And I think that that's the key strategy, right? So like if we're talking, so in this case, like I was just talking about true crime and it is legit a trending true crime situation. Like, Mm -hmm. like literally there are billions of articles. There's like datelines covered it. Like there's, I mean, Dr. Oz had it on, like there's, it's a big deal, right? This one case that I'm in the groups for or whatever. And so it is trending, right? But there are also other, other cases that are trending. And what I'm saying is I'm not saying go try to be exploitative and make something specific for about this case um, in order to sell shirts and like, make money off the fact that like these people are in pain. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is take a look at the memes, take a look across like at the a broader scale look at like what's happening in these groups, what these people are talking about, what their opinions are, that sort of thing. Because then you can extrapolate from all of that broader scale information things that are like true crime type things that you can put on shirts that aren't about any one specific case, right? That are gonna sell in your shop. So in a sense, you're looking at like what's trending in in the world of true crime right now, for instance, right? And then like you're using ideas to like help these people identify themselves and identify others that are like them in the marketplace. Because I'll tell you, Honestly, lots of people think that like an interest in true crime, like if you're not into it, they think it's weird and creepy, right? So a lot of the times, like us true crimeys, we won't talk openly about the fact that like we watch Dateline or like we're into these groups or whatever, because people are so mean to you. (laughs) Like they're just, 
they are mean. They think that like you're a creeper or weirdo. Like, why are you watching some shows a bit murder and like whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So it, if we're out in the world and we see a shirt and it's like wine and true crime or like, you know, like it's something interesting. We're like, hey, I can talk to that person because like they're going to get me. We can talk about all these different kinds of things. But even inside of that niche, there are like subcategories, right? There are people who are really just interested in like serial killers. There are people who yeah, are really yeah. just interested in kidnap stories or like whatever, right? Like there are people who are only really interested in specific cases, right? So it's like there's always going to be those little sub niches that come out of that overarching niche that you're looking at or that you're like trying to work inside of. Um, and there's always going to be more generic or general ideas that you can use to create shirt designs that aren't specifically exploitative, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Zachary, Zachary said, says, I, 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 am I, why am I uh, getting feedback here? Uh -oh. uh, uh, with that experience, I can buy a shirt in Etsy. Yes, you can. I don't know uh, if that's exactly what you're meaning. Maybe you could sell. Do you mean you could sell shirt? Not sure, but uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want as long as there's like. So you, I think what he maybe or she maybe means is that I should say I think what they mean is that um, without any design experience, they can maybe find SVGs to buy on Etsy to put on shirts, mm. right? And you can right. nice. you can yeah. find those SVGs um, scalable scalable vector graphics on Etsy from sellers who are making the designs and just selling them. The downfall to that, to Jay's earlier point, is that if you don't edit those designs in any way, or, like you want to read the terms from the shops that you're actually buying from, because some of them say that you're not allowed to edit the designs, right? And if you're not, then you run the risk of like other shops having that exact same design. And then it's not really, you don't, like as your customer, you don't really get that exclusive vibe. If like I can buy it from you or I can buy it from like 12 other shops, right? So you want to be working with the kinds of designs that you are allowed to manipulate and edit, right? So that you can make it more specific to your brand or your store. Um, but yeah, you can find those designers on Etsy just the same as you can find them like on Behance or in, I think you said DeviantArt and all of that other stuff, right? Like or on Fiverr or whatever, right? So then... So oh, good, yeah. you can listen notes. That's great. Uh, awesome. We'll also have the replay on the Ready Aim Scale page and on the YouTube channel, depending on where you're looking at. I think you're on the YouTube, so you'll be able to watch this again too. So don't feel too terrible about it. Yeah. So then, yeah. Rustic Design says, "I'm truly an evergreen guy now," and I think that that's the key, man. Like you have to have evergreen. I feel like you can throw up some stuff like every once in a while that's like more trendy or whatever, just to, like see a little spike. But sure. the longer term strategy for sure is to work on those evergreen designs, the things that are just going to sell all the time, all year round, that you don't have to put a crazy amount of effort into. Because that also, once you have a good baseline of sales that way, you you are open in terms of your time to like having the time to make one or two trendy designs for that shop or opening up a different shop for a separate niche. Like you're not tied down to constantly chasing the trend and maybe constantly being behind or like, you hear about the trend when it's up here, you, you put your design up and it's up here and then all of a sudden it's going down. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, and I uh, you gotta differentiate too between trending and seasonality because for example, seasonality, uh, something along those lines would be something like for Father's Day or something like that, right? So it's, it's things that, you know, a design will sell now for Father's Day in the next three weeks or whatever it is. Um, but every year that could potentially have a spike, but, in uh, a specific, a more specific way. I mean, fathers have birthdays all year round too. So a Father's Day design is not only good for Father's Day, it's also good for almost any day of the year that somebody can identify with whatever design or slogan is on that shirt, right? So yeah. uh, trending, where a trend would end up, has a finite lifespan usually. Uh, what does it mean when your title is truncated on Etsy? So I'm not sure in what context you're using, but truncated is like shortened. So. Are you uploading from somewhere else with maybe too many characters and then they're just cutting it off? I think that's probably what you're alluding to, but I'm not entirely sure. So let us know, hit us up and let us know with that. And then, oh, oh well, I want to share this one. Hi, William. Me too. <laughs> 
and then I'll go back down here. So um, I think this is where I've been working on POD websites like Redbubble, Zazzle, Merch, T Public, etc. I find these platforms don't really care for brands, and it's true. Okay, so here's this is one of the like major topics that comes up when we're talking about any of these um, design things, branding things, marketing things, all the time. Like those platforms don't really care for brands because you're having a brand on those platforms doesn't really accelerate their sales. If, if you're following what I'm saying, right? So like, even if we look at Etsy, like how you search for something on Etsy, you're gonna type something into the search bar if you're a shopper, and then you're not necessarily really clearly seeing what brand it's coming from. You're seeing the designs that have recently sold that are doing really well for based on whatever criteria you typed in, right? So when you're looking at that, like, yeah, at the end of the day, these platforms don't necessarily um, care about the branding, but you as a specific individual should. And the reason I say that is that when you're playing in anybody else's sandbox, so you're playing on Etsy, you're playing on eBay, you're playing on Redbubble, whatever, you're, you're having to kind of fall into their categories, you're having to follow their rules. So if they make changes that you don't like, or if they decide for whatever reason that they're gonna shut down your shop, your income just kind of evaporates when that happens right? For that one platform that you're working on. Whereas if you've spent the time kind of really learning about the target audiences, about the trends, about like what those people like, and then slowly kind of moving some of that stuff into your own brand, right? You have a bit more control. Like not only do you have more control over your marketing, like you're allowed to talk to your customers about follow my newsletter, you know, uh, we're having this sale, whatever but you also have a bit more control over, you know, the end result and like your social media and how you push these things, right? So we always say that it's kind of like a progression, right? Yeah. You'll start, we see most people, like a great idea if you're brand new to this is to kind of start it on merch because on merch, what you're learning about is really what designs are going to sell, right? And for what niches. Then from merch, we usually say, okay, then go on to a different platform that maybe does some of the marketing for you, like Etsy or Redbubble or Zazzle or whatever, right? You go onto one of those different other platforms. Those platforms are spending some money marketing to get people on there shopping. And traditionally, by the time people have hit those platforms, they're looking to buy. They're not kind of boot kicking like, you know, sometimes you see in other marketing, right? So then what you're learning about in those platforms is like customer service, listing your turnaround times appropriately, communicating, all of that kind of stuff is the, that like next level stuff that you're not learning on merch because Amazon handles all of that for you. But now you're having to kind of get good at when you're on one of these platforms and you're getting questions from people who maybe want to buy something or they want a coupon code or they have an issue with their order, right? And then once you've spent a sufficient amount of time over there, really like kind of narrowing in like honing in um all the processes that go along with like the customer relations and the management of sales and promotion and stuff like that then the next step is to kind of move out and elevate on your own brand right and then you're going to drive your own marketing now when i say this a lot of people will ask me so you're saying i need to shut down my etsy stores my zazzle my red book and whatever or Redbubble to go over to Shopify. And no, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is it's a great idea that in, in I don't know what the word is, conjunction, I guess, with um, whatever else you're doing on those platforms, you have your own shop. And that's just to or, say yeah. that like, really? you're learning about your marketing, you're learning about how to drive people over to your shop. Traditionally, you're paying a little less in terms of fees, right? Once you're on that different platform, if you can get enough people on that platform, you do get breaks on like even processing fees in terms of um, credit card processing and stuff like that. Like as you're driving traffic through and it's, it's converting, right? So why wouldn't you? Like those platforms traditionally, once you get to a certain point with them, almost manage themselves, right? Like you have your policies, you have, I know Etsy snippets that we use quite consistently, which are like, you get a lot of questions that are the same. So in Etsy, if you're on a computer, you can actually save your response as a snippet and just reply with that um, to customers because it's the same question that you've been asked 15 times, right? So like it starts to become a less time intensive process 
And then why would you not spend some time learning how to kind of accelerate your brand or to scale your stuff further um, so that eventually if your idea is to sell your brand or to sell, you know, your little business places, um, you have the ability to do that because I'm telling you some of these brands sell for like exorbitant amounts of money. Right. And like, they're not even always super well-established brands. Like sometimes you'll see like a bookseller, for instance, like on KDP that might only have five best-selling books. Now I say only five best-selling books. That's an accomplishment in and of itself, but you know, like that's it. There's not like a thousand books in their catalog that are selling bestseller status all the time. And sometimes those brands will go for like 250 US dollars or 250,000 US dollars or 300,000 US dollars because the person who buys them sees, oh, well, I have a bunch of other books that are like fall right into these lines of this, you know, five bestseller categories. And I'm going to blow this brand up and it's going to be, you know, making a million dollars for me in two years or something. Right. Yeah. So, like, you have to understand the value in actually associating what you're doing, all of this effort that you're putting in on a consistent basis with a brand, with something that if your exit strategy is to sell it to somebody else and bank the money and go do something else, like it's a very viable strategy, right? For sure. And it's a, it's a great long-term play because like, if you, you know, sure, uh, Etsy or whatever, you get the fees and the, but the next logical step, like you, you don't understand how, much you're paying until you hit a, have a successful Q4 in Etsy and you're paying upwards of five, six hundred dollars a month in uh, a week, sorry, in Etsy fees, right? So you're paying like, you know, upwards of, you know, fifteen hundred to two grand in a month, in one month on Etsy, just in fees when that money could have been put to blowing up your brand on your own marketing and your own website, right? That sort of thing. So um, that said, too, People will pay for a well-branded item. They will pay fifty dollars for a T-shirt as opposed to twenty-nine ninety-five, right? Or even fifteen bucks. Like, um, so yeah, branding to me is absolutely important. Uh, double up on niches, even triple. Like Gemini Engineer, Fisherman. Um, yeah, I mean that can work for sure. <laughs> crazy Cat Gemini Nurse with. Uh, well, I'd even throw Crazy as its own in there, so that's a quadruple for sure. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, whatever whatever you think you can do better than, you know, what the competition is or fill a hole, like, for sure. Well, and that's, that's a good point when it comes to, like, doubling up on niches or even tripling up, right? Because, like, how many other crazy cat, crazy Gemini nurse shirts are there going to be in the marketplace? But that could be something that people are, like, really buying and it does really well for a while, you know what I mean? And so, like, you always have to be thinking outside of the box. You have to be thinking about what's not in the marketplace that there is an audience that wants to buy this thing, right? And then you create that. And then all of a sudden that audience, like if you've got a good enough relationship with them, will start to give you other ideas for things that are not in the marketplace that they want you to create, right? The sign of an, a disengaged audience is if they're telling you to create things that are already in the marketplace that they could buy somewhere else. It's because they don't care enough to actually go like dig deep. They're not into that niche or invested enough in, in that category to actually care what's in the marketplace, right? The sign of an engaged audience are people like, you know, I really wish there was a keto shirt that said something funny about keto. You know what I mean? Like, and they'll say, they'll say, blah, blah, blah. They'll tell you what they want. Or I really wish there was like, a dog sh um, shirt that I could have that could match my dog. And, you know, like the joke was, did we just become best friends? And the, the dog shirt says yes or something. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're going to give you ideas like that, that are very specific to their specific interests. Right. And a lot of the times those ideas can become best bestsellers in your shop if you execute them properly um, by putting a great design up, you know, pricing it appropriately, that sort of thing. So we've got a couple of um, other questions. And then we've been on for about an hour. So we're going to call it after these couple of questions. So it's Mark said, hello, everyone. Hi, it's Mark. William said, I had to stop advertising since the new system came out. My first sale with Etsy's new ad system took almost my entire profit margin. I only use my own advertising now. So two things here, I would say is that uh, if you if you're talking about the offsite ads, you can only opt out if you, I think you've sold under $10,000. Uh, if you've sold more than that, you cannot opt out. So I'm going to assume that you're not there yet and you've opted out. Um, and if we're talking about the offsite ads, then 
it may have taken almost your entire profit margin. So number one, raise your prices. Uh, but B, if it uh, didn't, e even if it took a little over or a dollar more than your profit margin, um, compare that to how many more conversions you've been getting since they've implemented this. Because if you rationalize that the people in your shop, like Etsy is putting more eyes on your product, it's okay to spend you know, seven or eight dollars on that ad for that one product if, if, if it's getting more eyes perpetually on your shop, right? Because all those other items that you sell to other people later down the road won't have had, like, it, it, I guess an instance where you'd have to pay on that. Uh, if you're talking about the Etsy ads within Etsy, then you absolutely need to look at um, raising your, your list prices for sure. Um, you should not be I mean, I, I don't know, I need more specifics here, but I think if you're, uh, if you're talking about the ads within Etsy for sure, then um, examine your listings too, because I don't understand how you would um, possibly burn through your profit on like one listing. I don't even know where you'd break that down. But, All yeah, right. it's, yeah. it's the weird one, but I think William's in our group, isn't he? Isn't he in Ready Game Scale? I think he is. I, you I can ask him there too. You can give us more specifics if you don't want to like share, share. Anyhow, yeah, um, Terry enough. says, sorry. <laughs> Terry says, on E rank, when I do an analysis of my shop, it states the listing is too long truncated. What does that, does that mean some of your title is not seen? So no, sometimes um, on E rank, like it will truncate your results if you're using all of the characters, I think. I'm pretty sure I've seen that happen in my shop too. Um, that being said, like on Etsy, as long as your titles and stuff are not truncated, then it should be fine. Right. So on E rank, I don't know, like, I don't know what you mean when you do an analysis of your shop, like when you're trying to see, I guess the graded listings, um, like how you're doing in terms of like the words and the descriptions and all of that other stuff. Cause I know Marmalade used to do this too, where like, you could just run like you would link your shop and then it would basically grade every single listing that you had in your shop and it would give it like an A, B, C, D, E, or F based on a variety of different criteria, right? So it would be like your title, not using the same titles and tags, like all of the criteria that basically people had figured out through trial and error um, was necessary for how I guess the algorithm would rank you, right? And so if that's what you're talking about, something similar on E-Rank, I wouldn't necessarily worry about it being truncated because E-Rank is designed to like pull in all of the most important information. Um, I wouldn't worry about it unless it's specifically truncated on Etsy because you're using like Printful to push to Etsy and not doing it the other way around. Yeah. Uh, he says, yes, offsite ads. So yeah, so um, on that note, then you can raise, so, if you've made under X amount, you're probably going to only see or be dinged for that um, conversion on that ad uh, on 10% of your overall sales, right? So the other 90% of those sales, if you increase them by less than a dollar, you will have made up for that um, that one you know sale cost for that conversion. Uh, the other thing with that is that your Etsy's showing your stuff to everybody, and you're not paying for clicks. Like that's they're, they have marketing departments worth hundreds of millions of dollars and, and put so much into everything to do what they're doing correctly and to the best of, you know, the benefits for you and them, right? Because if you make money, they make money. Um, I love the offsite ads because there's no way I would be advertising on, on the Pinterest and wherever, on Google Shopping, any of that stuff because the cost per click is just insane, right? Like it just skyrockets pretty quickly and you can get, spend a ton of money. So, um, it's a simple one to me is just raise your prices a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, and then, yeah. um, so thank you for your time, loving the advice, keep up the great work. Thank you for joining us yeah. and listening to us. And then um, I'm going to take a look into Etsy with Shirley in mind. How many Etsy accounts or niche stores can you have? So I don't think they put any limit on it. So like as many as you want. Um, naturally yeah. though, like for your own purposes, if not like going crazy, I would say you want to start with, you know, since you're already selling on Redbubble and, and Zazzle and all these other places, start with the things that are already selling well over there, create a little niche around that 
on your Etsy store and then just like capitalize on the shoppers that are just shopping on Etsy because that's the other thing. Like I didn't used to believe that there were people that would only shop on Etsy. Like yeah. when somebody told me that, I thought they were completely full of crap. I was like, that's not true. Right. And then they were like, just go see, like go try to like, you know, put up a shop over there and you're going to get different customers and you're going to hear those customers tell you that essentially like they'll only shop on Etsy. And then that happened to me. And I was like, what, like, what do you mean you only shop on Etsy? Like what, like why? Right. <laughs> Cause I was like, in my head, it was like, I was mind blown. Cause I was like, what, like what? Right. And, um, they were like, well, because I can just check out with all my things in one thing, like one cart area, I see everything that's in my cart. And then like, I don't have to go check separate emails to like figure out what shipped from what hasn't like the convenience for them. And like the novelty of the fact that like Etsy isn't super saturated with like Walmart esque type styles and things like that. So you're getting usually like unique stuff, lots of handmade stuff, lots of artist made stuff. Yeah, it's a branding and exclusivity thing, right? Like, yeah, that that, that one too much like Etsy. really keeps people on the platform. And Etsy knows this, and that's why they make these changes to the platform over the course of time to keep people on the platform even more, right? So when you think about that, it's like, yeah, you want to make sure that you're spending the, the appropriate amount of time um, on your Etsy, like making sure that your listings are ranking for the things that like you sell, but even more than that, you kind of just want to be thinking, okay, the more that I can spread this out or like the better I can scale this out to even different marketplaces and eventually into my own brand, the more that I can say like, this is a, a bigger piece of the pie that my shops collectively are, are basically dominating in the marketplace with. Right. Yeah, and and I would if say your end goal is to sell. It makes it awesome. Yeah. And I, I would say like, if you open uh, a store on Etsy, uh, yeah, so there's no actual limit in terms of the actual question, but I would stay laser focused on one until it's making you enough money that you can, you know, put efforts into other ones. You're going to spread yourself too thin if you're only putting 20 designs a pop across like five stores or something, right? So uh, spend the time where it's making you money and build something until it's making you money. Yeah, like I'm telling you, I'm telling you, but there are shoppers that will literally only shop on Etsy. And it's like, that blew my mind. I was like, I, cause like, I would try to get those people on my newsletter. They'd get on the newsletter and they'd be like, is this available in your Etsy shop? Even though they could just buy it from my website that was linked in the newsletter. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm telling you, people are, are like that. And it, and it's not a small amount of people either. There's like a, a good chunk of them that are Etsy specific shoppers. So this is gonna be the last question that we take cause we're just, we've got a little over time. So Patty says, want to do a political store under the radar. Don't want my grandma's getting upset on Etsy. Um, any way to do this legally? What do you know about WooCommerce? Thanks. So I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah, so I think, um, <laughs> yeah, I think I kind of get it. So I think you mean legally on Etsy without disclosing that you're Patty. No, um, I, I, would say I think no. I think what she's saying, like, because then why, does she, why would she ask about WooCommerce? Oh, that's separate, I think. Okay, okay. So you sure. answered the way that you, you interpreted it, and then I'll... Yeah, I'll so the way I'm interpreting it is that she doesn't want her grandmothers to know that Patty is taking this political stance with this shop. Right? Okay, cool. So how do you create this kind of... If she's on the right, how do you create a left shop without offending the right-sided grandmas or whatever? Uh, legally on... I mean, legally in the broad sense of the term, you can do whatever you want, but... Uh, as far as Etsy's terms of service go, no, you need to be transparent and you need to be patty. So sorry about your grandma's, I guess. Well, uh, not, you know about WooCommerce? I don't. I do. So that being said, like you can set up your own WooCommerce, um, a political store under the radar. So like if your store's under the radar, I don't really know how you're going to get sales though, right? Well, like so- Under the radar from grandma's. Under the radar from grandma's. Okay, so basically, if I'm going to start a political store, um, this is kind of like a weird, I, I don't want to say it's weird because like, honestly, there is, it's not weird to start a political store, but what's weird about it now is that like, you're not allowed to run ads on certain platforms um, mm -hmm. that have to do with politics. So you have to have a very tight marketing plan in terms of how you're going to position your products in front of the people that would be potentially buying them um, in a way that doesn't come across as like gross and spammy 
and in a way that's actually going to encourage those people to buy your stuff, right? So because like I know even Facebook will disapprove certain political ads now um, for like shirt shops and things like that. So so that's one big thing. Separately, when it comes to WooCommerce, um, WooCommerce, I would argue, is a much bigger beast to learn than um, something like Etsy or something like merch or even something like Shopify. Like it's a it's a way more involved process because you're using a plugin, which the plugin is WooCommerce on a platform, the platform being WordPress. And then you're also having to figure out your own payment providers, linking that stuff in. You'd have to know a little bit about coding and design in order to make this look really nice if you weren't gonna buy a template. Even if you buy a template, you still have to know really how to work inside of WordPress. So if this is like something that you're you're new to, um, it's gonna be a lot of work. Like I'm just gonna say that right out of the gate. It's, it's not gonna be as simple as it could be even just like opening up a Shopify or something like that um, and paying for it. So that's just something to keep in mind. Is it gonna be worth the work? Are you gonna be able to do all of that work by the time these shirts are potentially at the peak for their sales. Um, all of that stuff is stuff that you just wanna keep in mind if this is what you wanna do in terms of the next niche shop that you do. And yeah, that's that's my advice. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for joining us. And um, if you guys are not members of Ready Aim Scale, come join us over there. We're super fun. We have a training library. We have actually a freebie library as well. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't even have to pay to join to like learn some more key things from us that we put videos in. Um, every single month in Ready Aim Scale, we do a monthly challenge. We're actually talking about opening that challenge to group members or sorry, to people that are not part of the group and charging for it. But if you are part of the group, that will always remain free and part of the services that we offer at Ready Aim Scale. Um, separately from that, we do like little contests and things. And yeah, it's just so bad to be over there. And you get your, huh? I was going to say, uh, I, I don't know, I think I, you were, or I had a delay or something, but we also do weekly live calls every Wednesday uh, based exclusively on questions that you have for us. So it's a total open Q&A session. Um, and there's a private Slack community where you can ask the community questions and like everyone's always helpful and nice over there and like has a whole bunch of answers and, and uh, is willing to help. So if you're not part of it, it's 20 bucks a month, come over to Ready Aim Scale and join us if you're watching this on the Ready Aim Scale Facebook page. Just click the little link to learn more. It'll take you right to the website. Um, yeah, and just come join us over there. Otherwise, we are still going to be doing these freebie sessions on Thursdays. Um, so if there are specific things, we're going to try to make sure that like we have a calendar so that you guys can see what's coming up in advance of joining us live. But that being said, if there are specific things that you guys have questions about for any of those topics that are upcoming, make sure you hop on live with us, you drop a comment and we'll do our best to answer um, to the best of our abilities. But, but yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you again next week. Bye guys.